hello. Um, we've been covering as best we can, obviously, on this channel, the horror of Gaza, the violence um, that has caused the deaths of potentially about one in every 69 Gazans, if you include those buried under the rubble who are very likely to have been killed. But of course, when we talk about any war, and particularly when we talk about the current war, the real biggest threat will come not from direct violence, but from people dying of other means, the conditions of life being under brutal assault in Gaza. And that itself is the very, at the very core of South Africa's case, alleging genocide against Israel in the International Court of Justice. Now, clearly, we have to talk, therefore, about the question of food, without which, of course, a human cannot live, and the question of hunger and famine in Gaza. And what that may mean, what it means in the here and now, what it may mean in, 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 in the weeks, the months to come, and obviously the question of genocide. And with that in mind, I'm particularly delighted to be joined today by Alex Deval, who is the executive director of the World Peace Foundation, but has been writing about famine uh, since the 1980s. I've been reading uh, your articles, Alex, uh, incredibly, well, bleak often, <laughs> um, but in, in, a, a, exceptional kind of uh, bits of research, which are very very important right now. So thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. So can I just ask in, in terms of hunger, because I guess, you know, the way many of many of us who grew up in the West, the, the way war is understood um, is often not actually in accordance with the, much of the reality. People often just see high profile incidents of violence, people dying through bombs, bullets, that kind of thing. So just talk, talk about hunger. Why isn't it recognised actually as because people think bombs and bullets—that's what they think war is. But you would argue actually this is the number one weapon of war. That's absolutely right. I mean, I think I think you've you've put your finger on it. And and in a way, I think that a very good starting point for our thinking is going back to the end of World War II and the reflections on inhumanity that immediately followed the war. Now, in, 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 in a book I wrote a few years ago, I, I started off with a quotation from Primo Levi, the um, survivor of Auschwitz, who said, among other things, the camp is hunger. Hunger is the camp. And he wrote, and let me quote, they crowd my memory with their faceless presences. And I could in, if I could enclose all the evil of our time in one image, I would choose this image, which is familiar to me, an emaciated man with head dropped and shoulders curved on whose face and in whose eyes not a trace of thought is to be seen. And I think it's, it's often overlooked that during World War II, more people died of hunger and related causes than died of direct violence. And if you read Raphael Lemkin's Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, the book in which he coined the term genocide, he gives much more space to the use of starvation, the restriction of rations as an instrument of genocide than he does to gas chambers and killing squads. And it was the, the beginning of the final solution in, in just in, 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 in terms of practical steps was something that is not widely recognized. It was called the Hunger Plan, the plan to eliminate something like 30 million so-called useless eaters from Eastern Europe and what was then the Soviet Union by starvation. And it was the fact that not enough of these so-called useless eaters were dying fast enough that led the Nazis to shift their strategy to, to, to mass murder through gas chambers and, and, and killing squads. And this wasn't something that was either new or, uh, or unique to the Nazis. Um, Lemkin in his book describes how colonial era genocides, such as the German genocide of the Herero in Namibia in 1904, used starvation. How more Armenians died of starvation during the, 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 the genocide during World War I than died of direct violence. And he described Stalin's Holodomor against the Ukrainian people as an exemplary case of starvation as, as genocide. But then the British and Americans used it too. So that in, in the closing stages of World War II, just to give one example, 
the the American operation against Japan included plans for a ground invasion, the preparation of the atomic bomb, but also what they called candidly Operation Starvation, to starve the Japanese into submission. And then after World War II in, 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 in um, post-colonial counterinsurgencies, the British used the same term, Operation Starvation, in Malaya. And my bookshelf are filled with examples of, of, of colonial powers up until the, the, the 1950s, 60s, and 1970s using starvation. Yeah. So we collectively, the West, used it, which is why I, I, I believe it was not put central to the great moral and legal reforms that followed World War II. It was still, broadly speaking, permissible as an instrument of war. Now that began to change. And there is a growing recognition that it shouldn't be allowed. There is a war crime of starvation, the, the, the destruction of objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population is prohibited under international criminal law, also in the Geneva Conventions as they were revised in the 1970s. Um, but that norm has still not been fully absorbed into the way that we condemn and the way in which we act against the, the act of starvation in, in, in wartime. So I suppose this is why in war we often obviously see headline deaths, but excess deaths is a, often a more useful measurement. So is it worth just explaining what excess what excess deaths is? And I suppose that's that's a more um, accurate way of looking at, at the impact of war. I, I think you're absolutely right. And what we see is that if, if you take a baseline of mortality before the war and you measure how that baseline increases during and, and often after the war, what you see very often it is the great majority of those who, who perish die from hunger and related causes. And I should say the legal definition of starvation is broader than just hunger. Objects indispensable to survival include obviously food and, and, and food production, but also uh, water and sanitation, health facilities, uh, shelter, maternal care for children. And if you destroy these or you deprive people of these, then that's what drives up. Um, uh, death rates. And, and when we hear of these terrible death rates, say, in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in Ethiopia or Sudan, the great majority are those who, who perish not directly from violence, but from these, um, if you like, these secondary causes that are, that, are, that are more deadly. And of course, the great majority of those who die are not combatants then. They're overwhelmingly children. In, 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 in any famine, you know, half to two thirds of those who, who, who die are children, usually children are un, un, under five, who by any definition are, are innocent. I suppose they all, and they all interact clearly, don't they? That if you have humans deprived of fresh water, of food, of medical supplies, if you're, for example, a pregnant woman, if you're someone with an underlying health condition, a heart problem, um, if you're yeah, a vulnerable infant, I suppose, so they, they, it's, it's that, it's, that's the horror of it all, isn't it? These different conditions of life overlap and then people are susceptible, more and more susceptible. You're, you're exactly right. You get a sort of perfect storm of hunger and disease interacting with one another. And these can also be lifelong effects. Yeah. I mean, children who are exposed to, to malnutrition, even unborn children or young children, they may never grow to, to achieve their full, um, their full potential. Let's talk about Gaza. So Gaza before this current horror uh, was under the longest siege in modern history, uh, a 16 year long siege. Can you just tell, tell us about what that siege meant when we talk about food and the impact? Um, I read this wrote a brilliant piece in the London Review of Books um, in which he quote the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, something along the lines of him, him, him saying that the, the, the object of the siege wasn't for them to starve to death, but to be put on a diet, which I thought was particularly mm. chilling. And worth noting, Ehud Barak doesn't come from the Likud or right-wing party, comes from the Israeli mm. labor tradition. I think that's worth pointing out in case people think this, all of these horrors are just constructed by big, bad right-wingers in the Israeli context. Mm. So just tell us about that context. What did that siege actually mean in practice? And what was the, what was the impact? How vulnerable was Gaza's population left before this current horror? 
Well, the, the Gazan population was almost entirely dependent upon supplies and resources that came in from outside. It was dependent the, um, on, on uh, money earned by Gazans who worked as, as, as laborers in, in, in Israel. It was dependent largely on food supplies that came from outside. Not entirely, there was some agriculture there. And, um, but also on uh, the water supply, the electricity, well, um, telecommunications were very largely um, controlled by the Israeli authorities, which is why um, even though the, the actual physical presence of Israeli troops and occupiers on the ground in Gaza for many years, were, they weren't there, it was still legally uh, uh, an occupation because of, because of that control. And the um, and putting them putting the the Gazans on a diet meant um, m most particularly being able to 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 tighten the belt at any time at any moment um, the, the the siege the blockade could be tightened so that um, the, the the Israelis who, who who were attentive to their obligations under international humanitarian law were quite careful, um, until October the 7th, of course, were quite careful not to cross the line of, of a point at which the, the population in Gaza was nutritionally deprived to an extent where the argument of starvation could be made. Nonetheless, the relatively small number of scholars who, 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 who look into starvation as as a crime or as a, 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 a an, an act prohibited under international humanitarian law um, debate as to uh, as to whether um, Israel's food uh, water and health policies fell on the legal or, or, or the the unlawful side of that line and the fact that that debate was was, was being conducted with two different opinions, I think shows how close to the line, in the most generous interpretation of what the Israelis were doing, how close to the line they were, and how even a small step would would, would take them into the zone of being uh, unlawful in their conduct. And again, I suppose you have this interaction, don't you? You have, you know, that, that being put on a diet, as Ehe Barak mm. put it, and also lack of you know, medical supplies for the healthcare system. The healthcare system was already in a pile of states mm -hmm. before this many hospitals obviously have been completely been destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you get kind of a, a population which is, I guess, more susceptible to illness. Um, and then you get a lack of medicine, lack mm -hmm. of a, a healthcare system that's able to cope. So it all intersects. Yeah. So uh, after October the 7th, the um, Israel was very clear in, in, in its statements, very senior Israelis made a whole you know, raft of statements about their war aims and their war strategies in Gaza, starting with tightening the siege so that everything mm. that, was, that was required to sustain life or to sustain a, a reasonable life would be shut off, um, in, in, including uh, forcibly displacing people. I mean, occasionally they said our aim is not to starve people, but to give the population of Gaza a choice between staying and starving and leaving and not starving, which is actually uh, a war crime under um, uh, under any definition. In fact, uh, the prohibition in the Geneva Conventions on, on starvation is very clear that it's unlawful, even if whatever the intent, including an intention to force people um, to leave. So. Gaza being, as it were, at the edge was very quickly pushed over the edge by actions that were at the edge of legality and clearly went into the unlawful zone immediately after uh, o o October the 7th. So the war crime of starvation uh, perpetrated at scale. What it did was it brought something that we have not seen, I have not observed or studied in, in, in my 40 or so years of, of, of looking at famine and, and, and looking at starvation crimes. I've not seen anything like this before. A population of over 2 million people 
that at the time when the hostilities began was stressed. It was not normal, but it was stressed, being brought almost entirely to uh, being in, uh, in what the, uh, the, the, the famine review committee of the uh, integrated food security phase classification system, that mouthful refers to this, this accepted set of metrics and procedures by humanitarian agencies for measuring food insecurity. They've gone from being stressed to being almost all in stage four, which is emergency, or in the final stage, stage five, which is catastrophe. And the reason why they're not defined as being in famine is, is because the, um, the nutritional status of the population back in, 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 in October was not too bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a long while for people to be reduced, even, even children, to be reduced to, 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 to absolute starvation. But what the, um, during the, the one-week truce at the end of November, it was possible to collect data and the famine review committee concluded after analyzing that data that if the current conditions prevail that is continuing attacks continuing deprivation of essential supplies probably by early february uh, there would be conditions that would uh, under the, the the very precise definition they were using would be famine. So that is a very convoluted, complex way of saying that what we're seeing in 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 Gaza today over the last few months is a phenomenon that we have not seen at this scale, with this intensity, with these dis calamitous outcomes um, for seventy five years. It simply hasn't happened. Um, in, in, in such a concentrated, acute uh, manner. It's very, very striking, as you, you mentioned, when that siege was imposed, the Defence Minister, Yov Gallant, declared, um, a to he said, a total siege and listed everything, including food, medicine, um, and he, he declared it on the basis that we're dealing with human animals. Some have tried to claim that he's referring to Hamas there, but he's referring to measures imposed on a civilian population. Uh, and a further army officer also specifically used human human shields, said that the Gazan population were collectively responsible and added, you wanted hell, you're, you're getting hell. So I think it's, it's very clear they just spelling out, I think, in, 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 in clear terms, unambiguous terms, what you're talking about there in terms of hunger being used as a weapon of war against the civilian population. I mean, the Israeli human rights organization, Betzlem, just went through some of the... Um, well, some of the means, I suppose, that Israel has been using to starve Gaza, which contradicts the claims of the mm. IDF that they're allowing aid in. So they say that almost all goods go through the Rafa crossing, which is not quick for massive commercial transport. So that limits the number going through, creating a bottleneck. That they've allowed trucks through um, the Kerem Shalom crossing, which is designed for commercial transports, but it was a merely token addition, didn't alleviate the hardship. Uh, they force aid organizations to purchase food from Egypt, preventing them from buying in Israel, which would allow for more efficient and rapid transfer of goods. Uh, they prohibit the private sector from purchasing uh, food. Um, and under the conditions, with the constant check, uh, the checking, multi so trucks are inspected several times, even then long lines form due to the conditions. Um, so it's just, I mean, that, that really spells out, doesn't it, that th this is just a deliberate policy there. They've, they've, what they're saying is we're allowing trucks in so the fact they allow any trucks in, they, they, they portray that as some sort of humanitarian gesture, but that's their legal obligation. And they're, what they're doing is they're, they're putting so many blocks in the way of their legal obligation that they're starving people. You're absolutely right. I mean, the verb to starve is transitive. It is something that one person does to another. It's not something that just happens. Um, but I, I, I want to pick up on... on one key point here, which is that very often the conversation about starvation, humanitarian emergency, comes down to the relief question. It comes down to how can we help these people, as though it were a natural disaster, yeah. and therefore the obligation is simply to provide food, medicine, shelter, clean water, etc. The primary obligation is to stop the destruction. The yeah. primary driver of this is the destruction of most of the housing stock, almost all the, the water and sanitation facilities. 
um, of the electricity, etc. That is what is the starvation crime that is being committed. And that is what is the direct driver of this cri humanitarian crisis. And let me give uh, a, a sort of a, a metaphor for this. A humanitarian crisis is, is not something that can be stopped overnight. It's like a, a big heavy freight train. And even if the, the driver puts on the brakes absolutely as hard as he can at a particular moment, that freight train is still going to take an awfully long time to come to a halt. And if the, the, the fighting were to stop today, if the destruction were to stop today, the humanitarian crisis would continue. Um, in fact, it, it, it may begin to peak and, and, and fall, but it has a long tail. It's not something that can stop immediately. And, and the pattern we see in wars around the world is if a war is creating a humanitarian crisis and there's a ceasefire, the number of people killed by direct violent action may drop precipitously to almost zero. But the number of people, mainly children, of course, who are dying of hunger and related causes will continue to rise, will peak, and will decline over a much longer period of time. And so that even if immediate measures were taken for an immediate cessation of hostilities, immediate provision of relief, there is still, as it were, this long period of time that it would take for this train to stop. And those deaths are on Israel. Which is why actually a crucial bit, which I didn't read out, which I should have read out, which Bexland said, was the little food that does get in is very difficult to distribute due to the constant bombings, destroyed roads, frequent communication blackouts, and shelters overflowing with hundreds of thousands of internally displaced persons crowding into small and smaller areas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what we're talking about here, I mean, I mean, it's quite interesting because there was a New York Times um, article that, uh, which which caused quite a lot of fury online, which suggested that the number of deaths, Palestinian deaths, had fallen due to a change in Israeli military strategy. Partly very misleading because we, it's not actually it's not actually straightforward to work out the number of violent deaths because international journalists are barred, Palestinian journalists have been killed en masse. It's very difficult to access much of Gaza. But 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 the point there is it, it, they were using a very narrow definition of death because they were looking at violent deaths, when, as you say, because of all these factors, if there was an immediate cessation and, like, a really big humanitarian um, mission was suddenly allowed into Gaza, you would still get, from this very moment, the moment it, that began, a huge number of people would die. That's absolutely the, the tragic reality. And um, Save the Children Fund and others have, have 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 said that quite possibly the deaths of from disease and starvation will soon exceed those directly from violence. There's another point I want to put in here, which is that one of the claims that is made by Israel is that Hamas is stealing and hoarding food, and I, I'm sure there is some truth to that claim. But the um, uh, in, in in all conflict situations, belligerent parties do this. I mean, there are very, very few exceptions that one, um, that one can think of. The way to overcome that is not to restrict food further. The way to overcome that is to allow uh, humanitarian agencies in to run their own operations. It is almost impossible for humanitarian operate, uh, agencies to operate um, under constant um, bombardment. Their own staff are being killed in, in, in large numbers. And and, and 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 therefore they are, you know, in the hands of of, of Hamas, which you know, which is a you know a ruthless, brutal, you know, patriarch, patriarchal, you know, far right organization itself that has no um, real concern for 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 any humanitarian outcomes, so far as we can see. So I mean, there isn't going to be an immediate cessation of violence that's just not realistic at all and actually you know they're talking the government of benjamin netanyahu are talking about protracted military operations in gaza what does that mean in practice if there isn't a if if you continue getting bombings i mean we've already seen you know experts have looked through historical precedents this exceeds everything from the allied bombing of germany which predates the geneva conventions but um, that was over a longer period of time. It, uh, it's it's worse than it's 
worse than it's worse than what happened to Mariupol in Ukraine. It's 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 worse than um, example in terms of ISIS in in Mosul. I mean, it's 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 a lot worse in a or in for example, for example the uh, the bombing of Aleppo, again, which happened over three over several years. So this is in a very short space of time. We've seen seventy percent of housing destroyed, damaged or destroyed. Um, huge damage to infrastructure, agriculture as well. I mean, I, I forgot to mm. mention. I mean, agriculture is being devastated. Mm. Um, in terms of water, I spoke yesterday as, to the UN Special Rapporteur on water rights and the potential flooding of the aquifer with salt water by mm. Israel. I mean, what are we talking here? What we've already seen maybe thirty three thousand violent deaths in a population of two point two to two point three million. I mean, what what kind of scale of death are we see? You know, in terms of how vulnerable people are in terms of food now, what's going to happen in the coming weeks? It's it's hard to imagine. I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is a crisis in which all the sides, you know, ecocide, you know, um, genocide can credibly, plausibly be, be alleged. And this is the case before the International um, Court of Justice um, at the moment. And it's, in, and it's a real challenge to, to the judges to see what measures they could instruct that would actually uh, in, immediately um, stop this crisis from uh, from unfolding to um, to to potentially to accelerate and intensify so that it the 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 outcome in terms of destruction of life and destruction of way of life is you know a, a, an order of magnitude greater than it is now it is um, it is a profound political legal and above all ethical challenge to um to respond to this so when you get politicians for example in the west saying look we urgently where they don't support a ceasefire but they say we urgently need to get more aid in you know the labor party has been saying that in britain without supporting a ceasefire it's missing the point isn't it because actually getting a trucks in may alleviate suffering on the margins but it's the 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 cause of the humanitarian catastrophe with regards to food and other obviously conditions of life which sorry things which facilitate life it's it's the war it's the bombing it's the it's the warfare that's causing the problem yeah it's it's giving crumbs to to the victims while continuing to pay the demolition contractor it it, it makes no legal or ethical sense so what do you think then in terms of south africa's case at the icj because you know, they obviously there was many elements to what they were arguing. They were arguing, obviously, in terms of intent, and we've heard, in terms of intent, um, Israeli politicians talking about uh, forcing the population of Gaza out by making it inhospitable. In fact, there was an Israeli general called Gior Island, I believe his name is, who talked openly. Um, he said, you know, there was warnings of a humanitarian catastrophe in the West. We should embrace that. And um, talking about hunger and disease uh, to break the enemy. And in which he also described, said there was no innocent women because they were the wives of Hamas. Mm. Um, and that was then favorite, that was then quote tweeted by the Israeli finance minister. He said, I agree with every word. I mean, you, you know, mm. what do you think in terms of, you know, they're openly saying, they're, they're arguing that in terms of humanitarian disaster is, is, is used to, to win, to, to win in, in those terms, but also to render Gaza mm. inhospitable. And the point when I, I talked to Omar Bartov, because this argument, is it ethnic cleansing, is it genocide? And the point is he made his ethnic cleansing can become genocide because people don't want to leave. Mm. So you end up, and that's the point. People have said, Israeli ministers have said, well, if they, they can leave or they can starve. I mean, do you think therefore this is just clear cut, it's genocidal? I think I mean, Israel has presented its, it, 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 its defense uh, at the court. I think that the, the uh, the threshold of plausibility for it being genocide has clearly been be, been been crossed, and and that means um, that the court should uh, instruct provisional measures, and the provisional measures that it should instruct should be things regardless of whether the the case of genocide can be proven or not. The the provisional measures ought to be to end this extraordinarily appalling level of, of destruction and human suffering. And um, th there is no way that the that the the court could could instruct, well, we're not sure whether it's genocide, but we will allow you to proceed with what are self-evidently war crimes and uh, reckless pursuit 
of a military strategy that is creating famine. They can't do that. So um, what it, the, the immediate obligation, um, and I hope the court gives a, a, a provisional order of this type, but even if it doesn't, it is so um, self-evident that the that the that the that the military campaign is creating starvation, whether deliberately or recklessly, across the board. That what is needed is an immediate end to that, and an immediate full spectrum humanitarian operation, including everything. Um, and and that humanitarian operation is only possible if there is an end to, to the assaults. Um, there, there is no other way of preventing a, a catastrophe the likes of which we have not seen for um, certainly in my lifetime. And, and just finally, just to circle back to where we started, really, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a bit macabre to suggest any good coming out of this particular evil, but I suppose the way of looking at it is lessons, that at least from the rubble of Gaza, something can be learned um, in terms of preventing these this entirely human-made calamity from, mm. from happening again. And the reason, you know, this is quite, I would say, an educational, instructive moment for a lot of people because mm. the West has been embroiled in lots of catastrophic military interventions, mm. but they're normally framed, at least, uh, they pretend often, they clothe themselves with the guards of humanitarianism. That's what Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, terrible crimes, I think, were committed in, in both cases. But this is such a striking case of a state not pretending they're liberating a people but actually talking in terms of collective guilt and therefore imposing measures such as starvation as a weapon of war with the support of western governments notwithstanding their occasional grubby hand wringing as they continue to support and facilitate what's happening and i guess do you think one thing that might be the legacy of this is there might actually be an understanding amongst a population as i said which is often in the west not really understand what Stand what actually war means about hunger finally being recognized as this number one weapon of war. I very much hope that there are some um, silver linings, however, how, however thin, however remote, one of them being, yes, the, the, the making starvation crimes as intolerable, as toxic as, let us say, the use of, 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 of chemical weapons, of recognizing that. Human rights have to apply to everybody, regardless. And, and and the Jewish people who are no strangers to suffering, for whom, you know, there, there is nothing that they can be taught as a people about what it means to suffer, but who cannot, um, if they are to retain that basic principles and, and humanity, have to understand that to perpetrate for the state of Israel, to perpetrate in their name yeah. such crimes on, on, on other people is, 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 is truly betraying um, not only universal human rights, but, but, but one of the, the most profoundly um, important animating principles of, of, of Judaism itself. And indeed, I think it's worth noting because I know you're speaking from the US at the moment, it's, it's fascinating and, uh, well, I think very inspiring to see just how many particularly younger Jewish activists there are involved in in building support and solidarity with the Palestinian people, often drawing on their own history uh, and, and talking in, in exactly the terms you have. And that great Jewish humanist tradition, which very much emerged from the horrors inflicted on the Jewish people uh, for so, so long, I think that that tradition lives uh, on, I think the Israeli state has mm. tried to crush it in lots of ways, but it lives on in Israel. I've obviously interviewed mm. lots of Israeli human rights activists on this channel, but amongst also, you know, in the US and elsewhere, younger Jewish activists who who keep that torch alive. Um, Alex, it's been such a pleasure. Um, often, you know, a bleak subject to talk about, but just so important to talk about. For those watching or listening, do share this, do hit the like button, leave your comments, subscribe, get the word out. It's important we talk about this as widely as we can. Uh, but Alex, thank you so much. That was uh, that was fantastic stuff. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I'm sorry that this is this this is such a dark subject. But let's hope, you know, no starvation in our name can be what is learned from this. Amen. Cheers.